I am so happy to have you here on a Saturday morning. Um, it is my favorite way to start the weekend is to get um, some insight from, you know, a, a, a contemporary working writer um, to start off my weekend and to help frame what I might be revising or working on in my studio. Um, so as an introduction for Ana Menendez for today, I'm gonna to read her, her bio and then turn over um, the metaphorical floor to Ana. Ana Menendez has published four books of fiction, Adios, Happy Homeland, The Last War, Loving Che, and In Cuba, I Was a German Shepherd, whose title story won a Pushcart Prize. She has worked as a journalist in the United States and abroad, lastly, as a prize winning columnist for the Miami Herald. As a reporter, she wrote about Cuba, Haiti, Kashmir, Afghanistan, and India. Her work has appeared in publications including Vogue, Bomb Magazine, the New York Times, and Tin House, and has been included in several anthologies, including the Norton Anthology of Latino Literature. She has a BA in English from Florida International University and an MFA from New York University. A former Fulbright scholar in Egypt, she has lived in India, Turkey, and the Netherlands, where she designed a creative writing minor at Maastricht University. She is an associate professor at FIU with joint appointments in English and the Wolfsonian Public Communities Lab. Um, it is a thrill to have her with us this morning. And if you missed the reading last night, I'm so excited for her forthcoming novel, The Apartment, that, re was record that reading was recorded and you can listen to it um, at a later date if you missed it. In any case, um, turning it over to you, Anna. Thank you for being here. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Thank you to VSC for um, hosting uh, this virtual workshop. And, and thank you to those of you who have shown up on a, on a Saturday morning. I don't know what the weather's like there, but beautiful here, uncharacteristically so. It was like 75 this morning, which you never see in September in Miami. Um, so I'm always grateful when people uh, show up to do some work on a Saturday. Uh, so thanks for being here. I'm going to talk about um, endings today, and it's something that um, uh, I think all writers struggle with, and readers also, and um, they're kind of mysterious in some ways, uh, and so I want to demystify it a little bit, maybe, um, and just talk about how I've approached them uh, in, my, in my own uh, working life. I've been writing professionally since um, 1991 which is, you know, a way of saying that for 30 years, I've been, uh, you know, getting people to pay marginal rates for my scribblings. And it's not long enough uh, to have made me wealthy, but it's long enough uh, to, for me to say that I now have not just one, but two novels that I've written from beginning to end that have never um, and will never be published. I've published other stuff that I like well enough, uh, but I've become obsessed with these two that never made it. And to understand why they never made it, we have to start at the ending, or to be more precise, the lack of one. Long ago, the writer E.L. Doctorow made a witty observation that many of you are probably familiar with. Writing is like driving at night in the fog. You can only see as far as your headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. Many writers have since echoed that idea. Here's Christina Enriquez. Uh, quote, when I'm writing the first draft of the story, I only really know a sentence or two ahead of where I am. It's like walking on a trail and you have your eyes trained downward. I can see the stone I'm standing on and where I'm going to step next, but I can't see the whole path or even long stretches of it. My two novels uh, remained unfinished in part because I took this kind of advice literally without accounting for the logistical reality that most journeys, no matter how dark and foggy, are pulled forward by the promise of a destination. At NYU, at NYU I knew uh, Edgar as a, a playful, irreverent oracle, and so that makes me fairly confident that he wouldn't object to my 21st addendum to his dictum. Writing is like driving at night in the fog. You can only see as far as your headlights and you can make the whole trip that way provided you've correctly typed in the coordinates of your final destination. Know where you're headed. Then sit back and enjoy the ride through the dark and foggy night. You don't need to know the details of every boring turn in the road, but in my experience, it does help to know where you're going. My two failed novels had 
did find an afterlife in the form of two published stories with a possible third in the works. And these were not so much derived from the original as they were distilled. And what distinguished those children from their failed parents is that unlike the sprawling originals, the short story endings came to me first. Endings are a weird thing. Nobody really likes them. Writers are spooked by them and they approach talking about them with intense caution, if not outright mysticism. Many will claim they have no idea where their story is going when they begin. Here's the great Haruki Murakami, quote, when I start to write a story, I don't know the conclusion at all, and I don't know what's going to happen next. If there's a murder case as the first thing, I don't know who the killer is. I write the book because I would like to find out. If I know who the killer is, there's no purpose in writing the story. I don't think he's lying, at least not consciously. The reticence that many writers have to typing in those coordinates stems, I suspect, from a fear that in deciding on an ending before their unconscious has had uh, a time to play out the possibilities, will stunt the story before it has had a chance to read it, reach its full height and depth. Rigidity is the enemy of art, and I myself have been wary of truly articulating a destination before my story is done. Readers, I will contend, also dislike thinking or talking about endings. They're like death. <clears throat> my son read all seven of the Harry Potter books during lockdown. And when he was done, he plunged into this depression and was just crying uncontrollably. And um, my husband, who's a scientist and not a writer, was a little bit concerned. But I completely understood this and recognized it from my own childhood, this sense of desolation that falls upon us when we are kicked out of the world as readers. So the ending of a book or a short story forces you out of a world which you, the reader, have been complicit in creating, but one in whose ending you have no vote and no say. Who wouldn't be upset about it? That's why as writers, we have to be especially attuned to the violence that our endings, no matter how perfect, inflict on our trusting readers. And the most violent ending of all is the absence of one. All our human endeavors from knitting to food prep to raising a child are sweetened by the promise of transformation, no matter how small it is. So this talk today starts at the ending. We'll try to approach it earnestly, steering clear of the more existential readings of endings to concentrate on what we mean at the ordinary workaday level of craft by an ending. My own idea of putting this talk together is neither to be so rigid as to prescribe an ending, nor so lax as to pretend that it doesn't matter where you're going. This lecture will try to hew a middle way, best articulated perhaps by the poet Jericho Brown, who, while insisting that he never knows where a poem will end once he starts it, nevertheless has written that quote, a poem is a gesture towards home. But before we talk about uh, endings in more detail, it's useful to find our own definitions of what constitutes a story. What to you is the definition of a story? I'm gonna give you one minute to write down what, how you would define story. A story is blank. So I just take a quick minute. So there's the standard dictionary definition of story that goes something like this, and this is from the Cambridge Dictionary. Story is, quote, a description, either true or imagined, of a connected series of events. At dictionary.com, I found this definition, a narrative, either true or fictitious, in prose or verse, designed to interest, amuse, or instruct the hearer or reader, a tale. George Saunders, in his new book, A Swim in the Pond in the Rain, defines story as, quote, a continual system of ex escalation. None of these definitions, though, talk about ending. Um, so we all have a definition of what a story is, and each may be incomplete in its own way. And none of them are wrong. But for the purposes of this talk, I'll add my own. For me, a story is this, a clash of needs that ends in some way. For the first part, a clash of needs, those needs can be shallow or profound, physical or psychological, 
And it need not be a centering clash, but merely say a fluorescence of needs. But anyway, need as the foundation of story is the title of a different lecture. We're here to talk about the second part of that definition, which is the ending. So to recap, a story is a string of images and situations that ends in some way. I realize that in some way is not a very satisfying or precise formulation. I use this very general bordering on meaningless catch-all to signify any number of forms an ending may take, depending on the culture and time in which the story is told. Endings like hemlines are subject to trends. Let me repeat that because people get all fundamentalists about endings. Endings like hemlines, male facial hair, and New York City dining are subject to trends. This is the point in uh, there's this is the point in such a talk where you would get a quote from Aristotle. So I'm going to spare you that. <laughs> My aim today is not an academic survey of endings. Much that is valuable has been written about the mechanics of ending, how unresolved endings invite the reader to complete the story, or how the twist ending manipulates readers in a way that are slightly satisfying. And entire books have been written about basic plots and the ending that's inherent to each type. So I'm not going to go over the stuff that you can already find. Um, you can look that up yourself. What I'd like to propose is that uh, a more per is, is a more personal approach to endings. And uh, so I'd like to suggest that as you go about your inquiry on endings, that you remember that the twist ending, the happily ever after ending, the moral of the story ending, the resolved ending, the unresolved ending, the surprise, the reversal of fortunes, the epiphany, the restoration of order, all of these, far from being said in some kind of literary Bible, simply represent trends that come and go along with the reputations of their prophets. So Henry, Joyce, Aesop, Monroe, and Murakami have their own distinctive ways of ending the story. Eisenberg has hers. You can often tell more about a writer and whether or not she is truly innovating by the way she ends her stories. So while it is fascinating to categorize endings along historical or academic lines, a more useful approach for the writer of fiction is for each of us to develop our own taxonomy of endings. So take a moment now, um, let's say five minutes, if it's not too horrible on Zoom. When I do this in person, I usually give students uh, 15 minutes to do this, but let's take five minutes because it's kind of an awkward uh, format. To um, think about two or three endings that you admired, that you really, that really moved you, that shattered you, actually. Don't look them up. Just write them as best as you can remember. Paraphrase, paraphrasing them, uh, you know, in whatever way you need. So, Think now, I'm going to put five minutes on my timer here to just summarize two, three endings that really moved you, um, that kind of changed your, your world, your perspective in some way that you remember. So just summarize uh, those endings and I'm going to go ahead and put a minute timer.
Okay, that's three minutes, so you can take some notes and come back to it. For me, the ending that shattered me was the ending from the dead from James Joyce. So, and we'll see that in a few moments. I'm going to go over it, why I like it so much. Uh, to me, it's the perfect ending in a perfect story. Not everyone agrees. Some people find the dead absolutely atrocious. It's ending forced and maudlin. Okay, that illustrates my main point. The study and appreciation of endings is a highly personal matter, and you can't leave it to other people to decide for you what makes a good ending. So from now on, pay special attention to the end of every story, at every public reading, at every uh, at the end of every short story, at the end of every novel. Open a notebook. Collect story endings the way Nabokov collected butterflies, sneaking up on them, hitting them with naphthalene, and mounting them on a board for lifetime viewing pleasure. Make up your own categories. The Monroe twist ending in the title ending. The Monroe twist hidden in the title ending. The Salter happily ever after plan gone wrong ending. The J.K. Rowling this is what they're like some years hence ending. If you have a nice collection, say at least 20 endings, go through them. Which ones did you find less successful or personally satisfying? Why? Try to be precise in what went wrong for you. Which ones shattered you? Why? Again, try to be precise. List those elements that are common to your favorite endings. You may find, for example, that all the endings that you enjoy have the main character back at the center. You may find that those endings address or even resolve the central conflict in the story. You might find that it involves an action as opposed to a philosophy or a memory, for example. Your favorite endings might return to motifs, no matter how subtle, that have been introduced at the beginning of the story. For many of us, great endings leave us not so much with an image or idea as with a feeling. Try to figure out how the author pulled it off. Does the ending in some way speak to the theme of the story that suddenly becomes clear? Is it an ending that speaks to the character who has been telling the story? In the story that I read last night, it's something that I consciously did in the revision. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a brief excerpt from a novel, but it's a standalone section. And it's told in the point of view of a journalist, a really kind of cynical journalist who's been fired or, you know, involuntarily separated in the words of the newspaper. And um, so newspaper stories have their own sort of um, stereotypical ending. It has their own, you know, kind of endings. In newspaper stories, uh, they're called kickers. And a kicker is usually a quote um, that, you know, leaves the reader chuckling or um, you know, turns back into, captures all the themes in a really pithy phrase. And so that's how I decided to end that story for that reason, because it's the way a journalist would end the story uh, with a quote that's kind of cynical and funny, uh, but that speaks to the theme of the whole story. So you make decisions also based not just on what ending speak to you, but what ending makes sense for the characters who are telling the story. And even though that story is told in a, in a third person, it's a very close third person. You're almost in her head uh, as she's talking. I also like what Charles Baxter says, um, you know, about reading stories as a writer, especially what is visible at the end that wasn't visible at the beginning, right? It's another thing to look for in, in endings. So, once you've identified your favorite endings, you have to take them apart the way a carpenter might take apart a chair to see how it joins. And it will, we'll do that with a couple of endings uh, now. Then you explore a few questions. As I said, how does it fit in with the rest of the story? When you read the story several times, you see motifs embedded throughout what initially seems a haphazard and intuitive organization. And this is certainly true in the deck. Right. Once you read it, you see all of these references to snow, to death, and then there's that super deadly boring party scene, which loses half of all my classes. But all that subtle authorial conditioning goes to prepping the reader subconsciously for all the images that come together at the end. We'll talk a little bit about that. At what point in the story does the ending come in these stories that you're reading? How is it set up? 
What feeling does it leave you with and why? What image predominates? How does it relate to images earlier in the story? What action is there? Finally, after you've explored how it forms part of the structure of the story, you can focus in closer on the mechanics of how the ending itself, and by this I mean the last few lines or paragraphs of this prep. Once you've done this exercise a few times, you'll be more ready to craft your own shattering ending. So to begin, look to the end. Before you write the first word, try to conjure a vision of your destination. It doesn't have to be very precise. In fact, depending on the kind of writer you are, perhaps it ought not to be. But do have a sense of the kind of ending you're driving towards, the feeling that you're aiming at. I've written all kinds of things, short stories, essays, novels, newspaper stories, newspaper columns, and the most successful ones have been the ones that started with a sense of the ending. In some cases, the ending has been very defined. In Cuba, I was a German shepherd. The title story of my first book started with the punchline of a joke that I heard as a reporter in Little Havana. And I knew that the whole story needed to end there with this hilariously tragic punchline, but it took a million revisions and a million different drafts. And when that story, it stories about four old men playing dominoes, when I, and it, you know, it ends with the joke, but when I started it, it was four, you know, a group, not even four, it was a lot of, of young guys, recent arrivals from Cuba, washing dishes in a restaurant. And it's a completely different story. Only the ending stayed the same. And it became clear to me in the series, in the draft that, you know, young people would not have the sense of tragedy embodied in them that this ending did for old people. And that's when they became old people. And the solution came to me as so many of solutions in writing come to me while I was out on the run. Other stories have had less defined end endings. To continue my loving doctoral metaphor, I know I want to end up in the Northeast, say, and in the course of the writing, I realize I'm aiming for Boston. And then at the last minute, no, I decide. Okay. Not every story that's come to me has come with the ending first. The ending first stories make up more than 90% of the stories that were ultimately satisfying to me as a writer. The reasons for this are no mystery. Writing is an act of loving manipulation. It begins with a disturbance, an unsettling idea, a feeling, a sense that overtakes you. And suddenly you see the kernel of possibility, like the stuff in an atom bomb, as Olga Tokarczuk, the Nobel Prize winning Polish novelist put it, that will detonate at the end. The ending is both the possibility and its greatest expression. So I wanna go through some of this uh, kind of surgery of endings before I open it up to some questions. Let's look at, um, at, uh, well, what some writers have to say. I mean, I, I quoted the writers who disagree with me, but I'll quote John McPhee, who um, I, uh, you know, is, says something that's more in line to my own thinking, where he talks about, um, he's got this wonderful piece in the New York on how he writes, and he basically says, um, where to end a piece? You know, somebody's asking him, he says, I usually know from the outset what the last line will be. I just, says it. And then he talks about, um, I, I have this in the handout, you can read it yourself, but it says, um, he when he talks about ending a particularly difficult story, so a dozen years later when Mort Sal was overwhelming me and I was wallowing in all those notes and files, he collected all these notes and he just didn't know what to do with them. Um, he thought back to a teacher who discussed structure with them. And despite the approaching deadline, I spent half the night slowly sorting, making little stacks of thematically or chronologically associated notes and arranging them in an order that seemed to hang well from the lead sentence. Then as, as I do now, I settled on an ending before going back to the beginning. So he decided what he was going to end with first, which was to let the comedian have the last word. My considered opinion of Nixon versus Kennedy is that neither can win. And he wrote that ending before he started writing the entire story. And that's what he built for us. So let's, let's talk about some of these classifications. Maybe we have time for a couple of them. Um, these are some of my own favorite endings uh, that I've put in the, in the handout sheet. 
And and here's the ending to the dead. Um, I, I won't read the whole thing. I'll just read that last paragraph. A few light taps upon the pane made him turn to the window. It had begun to snow again. He watched sleepily the flakes, silver and dark, falling obliquely against the lamplight. The time had come for him to set out on his journey westward. Yes, the newspapers were right. Snow was general all over Ireland. It was falling on every part of the dark central plain, on the treeless hills, falling softly upon the bog of Allen, and farther westward, softly falling into the dark, mutinous Shannon ways. It was falling, too, upon every part of the lonely churchyard on the hill where Michael Furry lay buried. It lay, thick, it lay thickly drifted on the crooked crosses and headstones, on the spears of the little gate, on the barren thorns. His soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe and faintly falling, like the descent of their last end upon all the living and the dead. So this ending to me does a couple of things. First of all, I'm a closeted poet, so um, there's there's so much um, just language in that ending, which is why some people don't like it. I remember I was at a conference in Paris a couple of years ago, and I was complaining that some of my students hadn't hadn't shown the reverence for the dead that I thought was appropriate. And a, a French uh, writer there said, well, I absolutely agree that dead is atrocious in the story and just really hated the story. So um, I think some people hate it because of this really stilted language. I mean, who talks like that? The snow falling faintly through the universe and faintly falling like the descent of the last stand upon all the living and the dead. That to me, it's, it's absolutely transporting language and a transporting image. And so the other thing that this ending does for me is, as I said earlier, it gathers up all of these motifs that have been sprinkled very lightly through the story. And, you know, the dead also, I mean, I think I could write a whole book analyzing the dead because the dead also has its detractors for that really artless opening. You know, Lily, the caretaker's daughter was literally swept off her feet, something like that, the opening goes. And, and people always mention Hollywood just get massacred in workshop and anything like that. Um, but I think that's all part of it, right? It, it starts with this kind of frivolous uh, image, uh, kind of artless. And then very slowly, uh, Joyce is inserting these images of snow, of death. You don't even know it as a reader because you're kind of lulled. And then there's that really long dinner scene, which is very lulling in a way, like a long meal would be. And, and the reader's kind of hypnotized. I mean, he's really doing something very uh, interesting with this, with this um, story. And I kind of like the, you know, so-called artlessness. I mean, we just read in my class, The Cathedral, The Cathedral by Carver to talk about characterization. That's a perfect story. It's like airtight, you know, he does all the right crafty things with it. And to me, it's ultimately not as satisfying as the dead because the dead is, has loose ends and kind of lacuna that um, then get, get, you know, sewn up for me at the end. And, you know, Jace, Joyce, of course, introduced us to the epiphanic ending, which a lot of people are over as well. Um, as I said, you know, endings are trends. They're like hemlines. We're sick of the short skirts now, and we're going to go to ankle length. We're going to go to the maxi bus. And um, so, you know, that's valid. Uh, we, get, we get certain kinds of endings become so popular that they lose their power. They become cliches in a way. Um, but still, there's a lot to learn about the epiphanic ending from Joyce, because done inexpertly, a lot of times you will see that a story just ends with the epiphany. And then I realize that, you know, I did love my father all along, right? And then the story ends. And that's not the way Joyce did it, right? Joyce, you know, he has his epiphany early, right? I've never loved anyone the way Michael Furry loved my wife. I mean, I've never known. That's an epiphany. That's like, oh my God, I'm, I'm missing this whole part of being a human being. So he has that epiphany. And then, but Joyce doesn't end it there. Joyce ends it with imagery uh, and with not just imagery, but imagery in movement, right? There's an action there. The snow is falling. And then, boom, story ends with dead, right? 
And I, I, as writers, there, we can't pay enough attention to the word that we end the sentence with. It's just, you know, it makes such a difference. It's like telling a joke. You know, you don't reveal the punchline before the end. You know, the punchline, the last word has to be hilarious. It's the last word that makes you laugh. And so here we have that epiphany followed by action, images, and then a final word that draws it all together. And that to me is just a perfect ending. Sunny's Blues to me also is an example of a perfect, perfect story. I, I assign it in every single class, even though it's rather long, um, for so many reasons, um, but especially for that ending. Um, and it's, if you have it, it's, it's very long, but it, it, for those of you who aren't familiar with the story, it's about a very fraught relationship between a, you know, kind of very academic and, you know, straight laced brother and his brother who, has had all sorts of problems and uh, as a musician and, 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 and you know, in and out of, of, of problems uh, in his life. And he's never really been able to connect with them. And um, so this is where it ends, where he goes to watch and perform. And um, I'll read here, you know, they're, they're playing. And he's never really understood his brother's obsession with music. Like, you know, what is this? Like, do something with your life. Um, then it was over. Creole and Sonny let out their breath, both soaking wet and grinning. There was a lot of applause, and some of it was real. In the dark, the girl came by, and I asked her to take drinks to the bandstand. There was a long pause while they talked, while they talked up there, there in the indigo light. And after a while, I saw the girl put a scotch and milk on top of the piano for Sonny. He didn't seem to notice it. But just before they started playing again, he sipped from it and looked toward me and nodded. Then he put it back on top of the piano. For me then, as they began to play again, it glowed and shook above my brother's head like the very cup of trembling. Again, I get goosebumps reading that. Ending the, the story on trembling for one. And this story kind of does what the dead does in that he's had his epiphany. Right, he realizes what his brother's music means, what Sonny's music means, you know, in the history, the long history of of oppression and violence, and he's come to that realization. And then Baldwin takes us to again an action um, where it's you know the, it doesn't end with the realization; it ends with an action that he's observing. And then it leaves us with the cup trembling. Um, just beautiful. Then there's another kind of ending. Uh, this is James Salter's Last Night, which, you know, fast forwards to the future. There's like a, there's, there's something that happens. There's an action, right? He's, he's tried to, he, his wife has asked, for those of you who are not familiar with the story, his wife, he has helped his wife uh, have an assisted suicide. But unbeknownst to his wife, he's also having an affair with her best friend. And when she wakes up from the assisted suicide, you know, having it failed, she finds a friend there and it's really weird. And then, you know, they go through with it, but the relationship with the friend and the husband kind of fizzles out. And, um, and so that's how he ends it, right? It ends with, I have to do it over again. I'm sorry, he said, I'm so sorry. Oh, you could end it there. Maybe somebody would end it there. He could think of nothing more to say. Susanna had gone to get her clothes. Clothes she left by the front door. Could also end it there. But then he fast forward. It's kind of a J.K. Rowling. And, you know, this is what happened many years later. That was how she and Walter came to part upon being discovered by his wife. They met two or three times afterward at his insistence, but to no avail. Whatever holds people together was gone. She told him she could not help it. That was just the way it is. Okay. So this is a completely different kind of ending. Um, there's, there's no action really. It's a kind of a recap. It's, you know, fast forward, uh, into the future from the, the story takes place. And it's a, a kind of a, a recap and, uh, you know, kind of a letdown of a, of an ending in a way, but it's a letdown of a story. So it fits the, the that particular theme of the story, whether, again, whether you like it or not. Um, 
then there's the enigmatic ending. These are just terms I've given them myself. This is something that you would do for yourself. And this is, um, you know, Murakami, again, the story Sleep. Uh, I'll never get that key. She's in a, in a car. She's unable to sleep as a woman who has insomnia. And um, she's in a car, and then the car starts to get rocked by these strange men. I fall back against the seat, cover my face with my hands. I'm crying. All I can do is cry. The tears keep pouring out. Locked inside this little box, I can't go anywhere. It's the middle of the night. The men keep rocking the car back and forth. They're going to turn it over. So this is a story, you know, it, the sentence in, in the present tense. And it also has a sort of little arrow into the future of what's going to happen that we're not privy to it. Right? We're, we're, we're stuck in the action itself. It's an action ending. We're stuck in the action forever, suspended there as readers without knowing what's going to happen, you know, two, three seconds into the future. I remember when this story was published in the New Yorker. Um, I had just started as a journalist. So I must have been early 90s. It was, you know, so controversial among my friends. I mean, that's all we could talk about was, you know, what the hell kind of story was that? You know, what kind of ending is that? And especially for a journalist, it's incredibly unsatisfying. Um, but for me, it was very satisfying because I have, I've read so much. I and mean, if you read a lot, you start to get tired of the endings that you've seen. And, you know, you, you kind of know what to expect and it's a, you know, you're, you're being manipulated and you know how you've been manipulated and then it's kind of not satisfying. And so an ending like this was incredibly satisfying to me because I was completely knocked over um, and just destabilized in the way that this woman is. And, um, you know, I, I've been a Murakami, that was my first Murakami story. It's the first, uh, you know, um, you know, my first contact with with him as a writer, and I've been a huge fan of her since precisely for this reason that it's not never goes where you think it's going to go. You know, he's not, you know, developing characters, you know, according to uh, Gardner, right? He's not, you know, coming up with endings that follow X, Y, and Z formula. It's completely wild and crazy. And, um, and I, I love that. As, as somebody who's read a lot, I want to be, um, I want to be surprised. So that's something else to keep in mind. So I'm going to end it there uh, and, uh, you know, have a conversation. I'm, I'm grateful to all of you uh, who are here. Uh, Madalina, Hannah, Sonali, Kate, Francine. I recognize you from, uh, I think, I want to say Warren Wilson. Um, so, yeah, good to see you all. Thank you so much, Anna. This is really exciting. And um, I also was thinking about how I loved how you said you're a closeted poet. <laughs> um, and, and, and I was, I was thinking about how I could apply this also to po poems and how poems and, and I was trying to fig figure out what internal barometer taxon taxonomy I might apply to like looking at poetic closure or poetic endings, um, which also kind of more often than not are like, openings are unresolved um, in some way. And anyway, I wanna open it up to questions and invite conversation from anyone in the room, um, Hannah, uh, Madalena, Francine, Sonali, Kate, um, feel free to unmute, ask questions. And um, yeah, thank you for being here. I had a quick question. Thank you so much. This is amazing. I'm, I'm working on a lot of short stories now and I, I admittedly don't think enough about the ending. Um, I just feel like I get there when I get there. And um, you had mentioned, I loved uh, what you said about the, um, like kind of what's in style and how that often like a trend can ride out and then the ending doesn't feel as satisfying because it's um, been done. And I was just curious what you think, kind of like where we are right now with endings and what you're seeing maybe either that's new or that's like been played out too much and you're just, you read the New Yorker one week and you're just tired and frustrated and kind of where we are right now. <laughs> Great question. You know, I, I, I've been uh, reading so much um, kind of historical fiction, I'll call it, not historical fiction, but, you know, already published for my classes that I, I'm not sure that I know enough about 
I haven't read enough of really contemporary stuff uh, to do it, but that that has spurred me to do so, to see what it is that the trends are. I don't know if anybody else has any idea of what, what the new trends are. I have been, um, I've been noticing a little bit more magic in uh, some of the stuff that the New Yorker has published um, lately. And I think that's a good thing because, you know, there's that surprise and it gets us away from the sort of minimalist, um, super hyper realist uh, kind of stories, which, you know, I like also, but one gets tired. One gets tired of stuff. This is the human being, right? Uh, we just get bored with, with things we've seen so many times. So that's why I say that you can really tell uh, a, an, a, the artistry of a, of a writer by what kind of endings they're doing. Is it an ending that is truly innovative? while still being in some kind of a tradition, right? Because, you you know, you're always, it's always this balance between, um, you know, writing in a way to be understood and within a tradition, you know, which is what we do um, with the genre of literary fiction, especially, but also to have that Murakami total surprise of, you know, this is where I'm going to end it, see what you make of it. Um, so I'd be interested to see what others have to say about what they're seeing in terms of trend. The, the only thing that jumps out of me is that I, I have been seeing a little bit more magic. Um, yes, Francine, I see your, your hand up. But you're muted. Can, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. I'm talking into my phone. I'm in, a, in the country. Um, Anna, That's thank you, there. first of all, for a wonderful talk that has my mind swimming through all the endings. I've enjoyed as a closet fiction writer, as a poet first. Um, and I wonder, as you're talking, I'm, I come from the French tradition, that's my first language. So I enjoy those very long, ambiguous, non unresolved endings, um, unlike some of my students. But I have a question about a poet. If you have any poems in mind where you feel the ending really encapsulate some of the aspects that you've been talking about here in this delightful hour. And I'm going to mute myself now. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you. It looks beautiful there. I'm, I'm envious. It looks like it's cold. <laughs> um, thank you, Francine. Yes, I do, actually. I would say, you know, I don't know how many of you uh, have picked up John Murillo's uh, new book, Contemporary American Poetry. Yes, it's it's fabulous. It's one of my oh, favorite collections that was published. Yes. Yeah. It's it's just wonderful. And I I love what he does with endings. And he, he actually has, <laughs> funnily enough, which I just opened to, has a poem called On Epiphany. Um that what I what I love about his endings is um they which I think, you know, I, I strive for in the short stories is that you, you, they make absolute sense of, you know, in terms of wh where we were headed, but they open up an entirely new space at the same time. I don't know how he does it. I mean, poets are like magicians. Um, but I, I keep it to, to try to figure it out, you know, and to try to translate it into, um, into you know what we do as fiction writers and I, i'll read you one of these endings especially that i um you know i mean this this the crown sonnet a refusal to mourn the deaths by gunfire free men in brooklyn this is just a, a, a shattering piece it's just so fabulous and this is a piece that builds on motif right on fire and it comes again and again and again and again and um and so it starts with you strike your the, the the sonic crown starts with you strike your one good match to watch its bloom and juke a swan song just before night wind comes to snuff it. That's the kind of day it's been. You're black and mild now, useless as a prayer pressed between your lips. God damn the wind and everything it brings. You hit the corner store to cop a light and spy the trouble rising in the cashier's eyes. And it goes on, it's just fabulous. And then the ending, you know, this goes through several sonnets. And then the ending is, um, I'll, I'll just read the whole thing. But that was when you still believed in fire, the gospel of the purge, the burning house. You used to think a rifle and a prayer, 
a pipe bomb hurled through a shopkeep's glass, enough at last to set the world right. Enough at least to galvanize some kin. Think Malcolm at the window set to shoot, or Huey on his high back wicker throne. Think Normandy and Florence, brick in hand, a black man dancing for the camera crews. You change the channel, there he is again, and begging. Find some bottles, fill with gas. Begs breathe, breathe in deep the Molotov's perfume. Say, strike your one good match, then watch it bloom. Right? And that's, you know, that's the first line. You strike your one good match to, to watch its bloom. So, to, you know, this poem does what the dead does. You know, I mean, it does so many things. But in terms of ending, it's that it is a collection of motif and images that acquire more and new significant meaning as the poem goes along. And so by the time that line is repeated, it means so much more. It's the same line, you know, same words, but it means so much more because of this slow accumulation that he has uh, worked, you know, throughout the, the cycle, the crown. So that's, you know, one example, I mean, I just, I, I'm, he's a friend, so full disclosure, <laughs> but he's a, a nice friend. But um, I just love his work, and um, and I love the craft of his work, and I know he spends a lot of time working on it, right? It's not accidental. He thinks about every line, and he thinks about how he's going to end it, and I think you can see that as, as, you know, as you're reading. So thank you for that question. Yeah, go ahead, Madeline. Hi, uh, first, I, I'll echo everybody else. Thank you so much for a really helpful talk. And for me, it's come at the perfect time because I have two short stories that I can't end. Um, and for one of them, um, I seem to have this mic drop ending sort that goes with the personality of the narrator. Um, but I keep, I keep holding back from going with it. Something urges me to, to worry that it's too cheesy. Um, and so I was wondering if you have any examples of like the mic drop kind of ending story, because I haven't been able to find anything on my own. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, the mic drop ending. Um, you know, it, it could work if it's again, if it's in keeping with um, the character that you've done. Uh, and that's, you know, it adds another layer of a, a thematic layer to the piece. And of course, only you know that. I know that as a writer, when I think I'm worried that it's too cheesy, then it usually is, and I take it out. I mean, it, it, one of the things that I do, I just finished this novel draft, and I had a line um, of some, you know, one of the characters saying, "Time is the as time is a magic carpet, and sometimes, you know, it wrinkles or some, something to that effect." And I, you know, every time I finish, and I have my students do this too, um, I, I was talking to Sarah about I have a new workshop format that I'm working now where the writer speaks and actually the writer gives the story and then there's a list behind the story saying, this is what I, and this might be useful to you. This is what I'm struggling with. Um, you know, is it clear, is X, you know, is it clear that this is being narrated by a ghost? Is it clear that, you know, the, the neighbors really care about her? Is it, you know, this is what, this is what I'm struggling with. And I, I, I as I wrote that line, you know, to my agent in this case, you know, I have this line, you know, is it too cheesy? And as I wrote it, I was like, yeah, it is. <laughs> and I just cut it out, you know? Um, so you know, sometimes our instincts are right. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're just influenced by fear of doing something new. So you just have to know which one it is. Uh, and, and this is where I find that it's helpful to talk to other writers, right? To give them the whole story and then say, after you're done reading the story, here are my questions, right? You, I don't never give them the questions before they've read it because then it colors the way they read it. Um, but, you know, after you've read the story, you know, these are some questions and as particularly with the ending I think other writers can be really helpful because other writers sometimes can see motif that you haven't consciously um, been working through and then they can they can say well I noticed this motif throughout but I didn't see it in the ending or um, 
you know, there's there's too much summary and not enough action, you know, given the way the story's set up. So, um, but what I would say is to just read a bunch of contemporary stories, like, you know, you know, the New Yorker, of course, is, is, is one, but, you know, there's so many different journals that you can pick up and just read them all and then concentrate on the endings and see what the different endings are doing. Um, because sometimes you can have the mic drop and then another paragraph, right? Uh, which, you know, again, that, that notion of the epiphany, you know, you have the understanding and then you have an action or you have a set of images. You, you know, there's like a, a modulation of tone. It's very, very much like music uh, or poetry, right? That then allows you, you to let the reader down slowly, if that's what you want to do, um, and, and and sort of usher them out of the world with a little gift. <laughs> you know, I think that's what Murakami does, right? They're they're turning that car, uh, they're they're pushing that car, and in the future they're going to turn it over. That's your gift. I mean, thanks for the gift, Murakami, in this image. But you know, that's the gift to the writer is this little nugget of future. And, and, you know, that's one way to think about how we do our endings, which is that we are, um, it's like, you know, instead of a housewarming gift, it's like the goodbye gift, right? It's like, here, take this and, you know, I'll, and now, now get the hell out of the story. And, um, so one of the things that you can do is to go through and, you know, I've always wanted to create a class and I may someday that just looks at endings, you know, that looks at the history of endings, you know, starting with O. Henry, you know, and, and well, starting with Chekhov, which I think is sort of the father of the short story, modern short story as we know it, and going through O. Henry and going through, you know, uh, Edith Wharton, you know, Roman Fever, which is also kind of a twist ending, so it's very satisfying. Um, and then, you know, on to Murakami and, you know, some of the, the work that's happening now. Uh, Eisenberg, I think, has great endings. That, that might be somebody you want to um, revisit. Um, what's her a really great collection? Something about superheroes. Uh, does anybody remember? Well, I can't remember the title of it now, but it's fabulous. Um, you know, people like Lydia Davis, right? Um, what she's doing with endings really... Um, you know, with these snippets of things that she does. Um, who's the other one? Uh, Rachel, um, oh, what's her name? Who's the one who wrote the oh, near moments? Um, I, I can't remember now the writer who wrote uh, the, the this trilogy um, that's all other people's stories about, you know, the writer got divorced, but... Rachel Cuss? Yeah. Yes, Rachel Cuss, thank you. <laughs> I knew it was Rachel. I wanted to say Kushner, and I was like, not Kushner, it's Rachel Cuss. Um, she has a real particular ending, um, which really irritated, you know, some of my students. Uh, and, and one of, you know, like the one with the dinner party that ends in the dinner party and thought it was so cynical and, um, you know, there was no light in it. And I, I loved it. Um, so it'd be worth picking up, I think, uh, Rachel Cuss, even though they're not short stories, it's a novel, but to see what she's doing with those endings, which is, I think, very modern. Um, it's one of the reasons I like her. I really think she's innovating in terms of endings um, that are, I mean, it's easy to just not end the story, right? That's like cheating. It's like, oh, it's an unresolved ending. And it, but there's nothing, you know, there's nothing satisfying. There's nothing present, you know, to quote Baxter again, there's nothing present at the end that wasn't there in the beginning. And so that's the trick, even in these unresolved, no ending endings, you're still uh, under a moral obligation, I would argue, as a writer to, you know, leave, give that parting gift, uh, whatever it may be, even if it's just an unsettled evening. <laughs> uh, that too can be a gift. Um yeah, it's it's tough, but I think this is where other writers can help. Uh, you know, you show them the piece, and uh, and sometimes just talking about what you're trying to do, it will come to you. You know, and asking for help and articulating the question to somebody else, you articulate it for yourself, and you articulate the answer. You know, so I'm a big believer in working a lot, 
and, you know, being at the computer, there's no substitute for writing, but then getting up and um, letting, you know, your quiet parts of your mind do some of the work for you. You know, whether you call it a muse or whatever you call it. Um, but that's why I say when I go for a run, I get my best solutions. And it's because the mind keeps working on it in some way. And then it gives you this kind of out of these sort of slant uh, solution to the problem that your thinking brain there at the keyboard couldn't quite come up with. So uh, you need that bit of looseness. So that's what I would say. I would say, ask, the, you know, give it to write up a list of questions for a writer, a writer friend. Uh, and then go for a run or a walk or, you know, take a shower, you know, do something that disengages your brain. Paint. I, I like to paint. And it's the only time uh, in the day where I'm not thinking. And it's such a relief. Right. And then things happen. And I come back to the writing with a, a kind of a new appreciation for, you know, what's going on in the writing. Thank you. That was really helpful. Thank you. Thank you for this question. They're, they're, they're great. They, you know, we all need to be thinking about these sorts of things. Not too much, <laughs> but you know, it's, uh, it's, it's important to be deliberate, I think. You know, uh, it's important to be loose and open and all of that, but it's also important to be deliberate. Well, uh, other questions before we close? Um, I just had one 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 comment or question to you, Anna. In your in your handout in the notes, you had like, you know, species, genus, um, like you know, describing the taxonomy. Like you really like kind of. I'm just wondering, like if like if you see it as like a kind of like a branch tree of like you know, and if you made a if 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 you recommend even making a chart like that for absolutely, for absolutely. Yeah. I've been working on one of those. I, I you know, it's like. It's a side project, so I, I don't have, a, you know, I don't dedicate the time that I should to it, uh, but I am. I'm doing it because all the endings are related, right? I mean, they're, it's an evolution, you know, uh, and so they, you know, we started with a kind of story and then these branches develop just as a natural evolution. And I, I do think it's possible to chart out the whole thing. I would yeah, be a good I, sort of open source project. To do. Yeah, I love <laughs> thinking about that. And that's and like also, the Arne Thompson scale for uh, fairy tales, right? You know, where everything's sort of classified in certain sort of branches. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, and also for us, I love how you what you gave us today is is an invitation for all of us to create our own taxonomy of of endings that please us as writers and as readers that as readers and that we could apply to as writers. And it's like our, you know, inviting us to make our own family tree of, of stories and endings and, and what, 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 sh what shatters us and what also we cherish um, and yeah. how that is, is what we, we might aspire to as, as working writers. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a part of writing is so personal. And if you're just receiving instruction and receiving uh, commandments from, uh people it's not gonna it's not gonna be any fun i mean <laughs> there's some joy in the writing you know yeah yeah well thank you so much and i i, I wish you all well and, and enjoy having fun making up coming up with your own taxonomy of endings and yeah and i'd love to see them you know uh send them to me um i'm not gonna put my I, this is gonna be recorded and published but you know um Sarah, if you send them, if you them. send them to me, I can pass them on. Yes, I'd yeah. love, I'd love to start collecting these. This would be yeah. fabulous. I'd love to see them. So, and good luck to all of you uh, with the hard work of writing, and um, stay safe. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank you so much, Anna.